Chris, if you'll go, Brother Chris, paging Brother Chris. There it is, Matthew chapter 25. You'll excuse me this evening, I'm going to take a break on the knee and, uh, and sit here. Somebody loved their pastor enough to give them a Three Musketeers bar. Bless you. Thank you so very much. I'm going to put that in there for later, and hopefully the jacket doesn't get dry clean before I eat that. <clears throat> Matthew, I've lost so many good treats that way. They go through the, the laundry before I clean out my pockets. Matthew chapter 25 this evening, continuing our series and our study through the parables of Christ. Right now, we've been in the book of Matthew chapter 24, or the book of Matthew chapters 24 and 25, for the last several weeks, looking at several parables. Jesus was at the very end of his public teaching ministry, and Jesus was answering a question. His disciples came to him and said, Master, When will these things be? We were talking about the end of times and the conclusion of matters and the kingdom of heaven. And uh, and so Jesus was answering, what is it going to be like at the end of time? What's it going to look like when he comes back? Uh, What are the events that are going to transpire in there? And so there's a series of four different parables that Jesus pieces together in very quick succession And they supply different details along the way. Notice with us, look in Matthew chapter 25. This has been titled, The Parable of the Ten Virgins, and you'll find out why. He says, then. Now notice that, that that transitionary word there. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, we'd simply call it the groom these days, but in that day, in that culture, they called the groom the bridegroom. Well, that makes sense. He's the groom for the bride. Now, notice Jesus here in verse 2. He says, and five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Now, let me everybody look up here. How many of you would like to be in the wise category? Raise your hand this evening. Well, that's why you came to church. Amen? Nobody wants to end up in the, uh, the foolish category. Now, how do you do that? Uh, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, and behold, the bridegroom bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. By the way, these were, not all, these were not the ladies getting married to the bridegroom. This was the wedding party, the wedding attendants here. Those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. They entered into the marriage feast and celebration. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now notice Jesus' conclusion and the interpretation and the application of this parable supplied by Jesus himself. What's that first word? Watch. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to get together as the family of uh, faith and the body of Christ here at Rose Park. And Lord, to gather around your word, Lord, on a Wednesday night, Father, uh, to be encouraged, uh, Lord, to be challenged, to be helped and edified in our faith. Father, we pray, dear Lord, as we open the Bible tonight, and God, I pray that you would break us fresh manna from heaven, and Lord, that you would help us, and Lord, that you'd personally challenge us through these teachings. And so, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. And amen. So we have here, we have here the parable of the ten virgins. Now, uh, I want you to notice that there is no uh, direct transition uh, between chapter 24 and chapter 25 other than one word. Notice that. What's that first word in chapter 25 and verse 1? It's the word what? Then. All right. So then means that something just before that is very important to something that's going to come after that. And that's very important. Now, let's go to our notes. and We'll get back to that. As Jesus was concluding his public uh, t- teaching ministry, and uh, just to give context, this is just prior to his crucifixion, burial and crucifixion. 
He taught these four related parables on the end times. Now, here's what they illustrated the importance of these two things. Number one, preparedness. As Jesus taught these four parables, he's teaching his disciples that, look, as you're looking for my return, this is what he was reinforcing over four times. Number one, preparedness. Be prepared. Uh, the, uh, I have a saying around here is, uh, in the ministry, as, I, as, as we work in the office, we work around, I've taught it to all those who, uh, listen, uh, preparation, success favors the prepared, all right? Success favors the prepared. Anything that you do, if you want to do well, listen, you don't do it haphazardly, especially in the Lord's work and the Lord's ministry. Uh, and so Jesus is illustrating this, listen, as he was teaching us, he said, listen, if you, wanna, if you want my coming to be good, be prepared. Number two, he taught on the importance of watchfulness. Watchfulness. Watchfulness is this. It is not only that I'm looking for uh, what I'm looking for, but I'm not only physically looking, but I'm mentally looking. I'm emotionally looking. That, that everything in my decisions and my actions and my attitude is prepared for this truth, this reality. And so the, the importance of preparedness and watchfulness. Now, I, I listed out those four parables. We won't go over them. We've mentioned them before. Uh, but it's important to note, these are not just four repetitions. Each parable teaches uh, different and important aspects. The, 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 the end of times and the return of Christ is so complex, one parable was not enough. And so Jesus, the master teacher, said, listen, here's one aspect. In the, we looked at the parable of the servants. And then here's some other aspects in the parable we're going to look at today, and then we'll be looking at several others. Now, the parable of the ten virgins directly continues the thought from the prior parable. Well, what was the prior parable? Let's look back in our uh, notes uh, in the Bible to Matthew chapter 24. This is what we studied last week. This was the fact that there was a king, the Lord, and he was going away, and he entrusted uh, different responsibilities to each of his servants. There was a responsibility of the servants to each other and their res- duties and responsibilities, all right? And then at the very end, he says, listen, then the, the Lord, the master, came back, all right? And so that is the then. The word you want to write in there is this, then. The word then. The prior parable, as noted by the transition word then. The then is when the king comes back. Now in this case, Jesus makes a transition to a new parable, not of the same king and of the same servants, but he says, listen, let me show you, let me describe to you what it's going to be like when I come back. And it looks like a wedding feast. Now, we all know what a wedding looks like, right? You don't know, but we know what an American wedding looks like. We're not so familiar with what a Jewish wedding looks like, and the practices were very different. And brides, you'll be very happy that you have an American wedding system and not a Jewish wedding system as we get into this. Now, look at your notes here. Jesus illustrates the nature of his return, that of a Jewish wedding celebration. Now, once a couple was betrothed, betrothed, or engaged. That word is B E. T-R-O-T-H-E-D. That's the word you'll see in your Bible, betrothed. That simply means the same thing we would call engaged. The groom would spend about a year, he'd spend about a year, either to build a new home or prepare a home for his bride. The, the usual time was affixed about a year for him to go off, secure a piece of property, begin the construction or completion of that home, or find a home and renovate it and get it ready. Now, When the renovation or building was done, a date would be set for the wedding feast to begin. Now, that celebration could last up to a week. That celebration could last. You think, ladies, you think you have a lot to prepare for for one day and one ceremony and one reception. Imagine if you had to host your family and his family and all your friends for a whole week at your house, all right, Uh, the day you got married. How many of you glad for the American system right there, all right? Now, on the day of the wedding... The groom would travel to the bride's home accompanied by a couple different things. Number one, by family, all right? So when the day came, they would begin the processional at the new home, and the groom and his family, and then friends. Friends would join in, just like we do today. Friends would join in. And then along the way, well-wishers would join uh, the the, uh, processional, and they would all travel and fetch his bride and take her back to their new home, where they would be married, that's where the wedding would take place, uh, and, the, and the wedding facilities. Now, 
As you study other, pa- other passages in the Bible, what you'll find out that the, all the guests would be giving, uh, given festive wedding garments. You know they still do that today in Israel. Uh, in fact, when we were in Israel, we, the, our tour guide was showing us different things. And when the, when the Israelites go to a wedding, even today, uh, the bride and the groom uh, will furnish to everyone their wedding garments. In fact, there's a whole other parable on that. And all would enjoy this happy occasion. Now, depending on the distance to travel from the couple's new home, often the groom would arrive late in the afternoon or evening, all right? late in the afternoon or evening. So the bride had no idea when her uh, groom or husband D.B. was going to pick her up, all right? I can imagine, I can't imagine the stress that would cause on brides-to-be. So the brides, uh, and if so, so usually it would happen, or many times, the wedding party didn't get there until the afternoon. Now that's just to the bride's house. Now they got to turn around and they have to walk all the way back to their home, all right? And um, now, if this happened, that the uh, uh, bridal party got there late in the evening, the bride's attendants would be prepared with lantern lamps, you see that, to help light the way back to, uh, uh, light the way both to the bride's house and back to the wedding celebration. Now, I, by supplying these details, I, and we're going to go back and reread the parable, I think you'll, you'll see it in a whole different set of eyes. Now, these attendants would have been the young, unmarried girls, the young, unmarried girls of the bride's family or friends. So, as we look at this parable of the ten virgins, and now we have a little bit better understanding of a Jewish wedding, we understand that these ten virgins were young girls. We would call them the flower girl today. Or we would call them some of the uh, maybe, maybe bridesmaids. Or, but these were typically young girls who were all unmarried. And they would be there to help light the way. Now, understanding the, a little bit more about a Jewish wedding, let's go back now and let's reread the parable with a more informed set of eyes. Notice Jesus said in 25, chapter 25 and verse 1, he said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So we understand that there's ten young girls, and these are the bridal attendants. Uh, they would have had their lamps and lanterns because they understood that, hey, the, bri- the bridegroom and uh, his family may not get here till after, right at sunset, may not even be until late in the evening, and they were ready to go greet him to meet him and light the way to the bride's house, and then take the bride and and all her attendants and and guide them with their lanterns all the way back to wherever the wedding celebration is. All right, now five of them were five and five were foolish. Uh, And uh, they that were foolish took their lamps, but notice this, they took no oil with them. Now, if it's a long journey, a long trip, you're going to need oil to resupply your lamp. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now notice verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, this long procession being stopped by family and friends and well-wishers along the way, he tarried, they all slumbered and slept. It got to be nighttime, and they all uh, decided to, uh, to get some sleep. And at midnight, ladies, can you imagine that? Can you imagine you've been ready all day, you've got your bridal dress on, you've got your makeup on, you've got your hair all done, groom does not show up, it's nine, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, eight, 9 o'clock, you all just decide to lay down for that, and at midnight, he finally shows up. He finally gets there with the whole party, all right? Now, at, a cry, at midnight, a cry was made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And so what happens? These 10 young girls with their lanterns, they get up, they light their lamps. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Of course, the lamps would have been wick lamps fed by oil. They trimmed off the burnt part, reloaded the oil to light their lamps again. And in verse 8, and the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us, and you go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom uh, came, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So we have here the bride uh, at midnight, the announcement comes, hey, the groom's on his way, he's almost here. These young girls get up and they, they light their lamps and they run out and they're lining the road and they light the way with celebration to the bride's house and they pick up the bride and they turn around and, and five were ready and 
five were not ready. And the five who were ready were uh, lighting the way, and five who weren't ready were scrambling now. And they had to go and, and knock on the guy, the oil seller's house, and exchange money in the middle of the night. And you know that process didn't take two minutes. And uh, but by the time they got caught up, listen, the procession had gone all the way back to the new couple's happy home. The doors were shut, and the celebration started. And uh, and by the time they got there, it was too late. And this Jesus said, now listen, this is an illustration of what it's going to be like when I come back. Then there's going to be two classes of people, wise people and foolish people. Let's get into the parable here tonight. Let's look first at the people of the parable. There's two primary groups in this parable. First of all is the ten virgins. The ten virgins. Now these are the young, unwed, bridal attendant girls. Now, in this parable, who do they represent? They represent the individual person. They represent the individual person as they await the coming of the Lord at the end of the age. Now, in the Bible, seven being the number of perfection, ten is the number of completion. Ten is the number of completion. You'll notice as you study, study the sub, subject of Bible numerology, now let me just give you a little caveat here, there's a lot of people with a lot of goofy thoughts, all right, on Bible numerology, and the internet has made it worse, okay, all right, <clears throat> any crackpot with a computer uh, can get on the internet and post a thesis and, uh, and, and, and think that they're the, uh, the, uh, uh, the next thing to Charles Spurgeon, it ain't always so, be very careful, all right. There are truths to be learned in the subject, uh, the study of Bible numbers, but the number 10 usually represents completion. This was, a com- this was to be a complete bridal party, all right, and you'll see that truth in there. Now, the second person in the primary, in, the, in this parable is the groom, is the groom, known in this parable as the bridegroom. This, of course, is the Lord who has espoused or engaged his bride and has gone to prepare a place for them. Now, now that I've explained the Jewish wedding process, hold your hand here in Matthew chapter 25 and go over with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 1. I want to read to you a very familiar passage of Scripture, which now that we've explained a little bit of Jewish culture, will make a lot more sense to us, which already rang a bell for them. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now listen, he says, I go to prepare a place for who? You. Now listen, the church is called the bride of Christ. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. Where's Jesus' home? It's heaven. Amen? Jesus was talking about the fact that he was going back to heaven. He was going to prepare a place for us. And when it was ready, he's going to come back and get us. Now, to the Jewish mind, to the Jewish listener, they automatically knew what that meant. It was the wedding celebration. It was the fact that the groom had gone was going off to prepare a place of reception. And that when it was ready, he would come and there would be a great celebration. And then we'd have the marriage celebration. We call that in the Bible the wedding, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Does that make a lot more sense now? That makes a lot more sense now. Let's go back to Matthew in chapter 25. Matthew in chapter 25. Now, so those are the, now, noticeably or conspicuously absent from this parable, of course. Now, in weddings, there's one primary person in a wedding, and that is the bride but she's nowhere to be found because in this particular parable uh, her part is not so much necessary Jesus is talking about those individually who are going to the marriage supper of the Lamb not corporately all right now let's go back and let's look at the plot of the parable now the anticipated day that's the wedding day has been a long time coming how many guys would say it's been a long time since Jesus went back to heaven would you say amen to that It's been a long time. The groom is at any time coming for his bride. Now, ten young ladies attend to the bride. These are these ten virgins. Now, all seem to be equal in two things. Attendance. They all seem to be equal in their attendance. They're all present. They're all there. All right? Not seven and three. No, all ten of them were there. 
and they were all equal in their anticipation. All equal in their anticipation. Listen, they knew about the bride. They knew about the bridegroom. They knew about the wedding. They knew that the groom was coming. They, were all, they all were fully aware of what was going on and that they were invited to have a part in that. Now, all were invited, all were gathered, but not all were, but all were not ready. Not, but all were not ready. Of these ten attendants, five are said to have been wise and five foolish. Now, at the announcement that the groom has come in the night when no one was looking at a definite or a, uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying, uh, has come in the night when no one was looking, uh, there probably should have been a comma in there, all right? Either I put way too many commas or not enough commas, all right? Me and commas have a very love-hate relationship. My wife is my editor, all right? And typically she says, yeah, she says you and commas don't get along. Now, <clears throat> a definite, underline the word definite, and defining, underline the word defining, difference is revealed. When the trumpet sounds and the groom has come, what looked like a group of ten equal people is now split in two. And we discovered that there's a definite difference and a defining difference between this two group. Now, rising to meet the groom and light the way to the wedding, five had made preparation. Five had made preparation by bringing oil. By bringing oil. Notice with me, go back with me to uh, Matthew chapter 25. I want you to see this for yourself here. Notice with me. It says this in verse 3, And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now it's interesting, this is just a bonus for coming on Wednesday nights. Usually in the Bible, when God gives a list, he starts with the bad first and the good second. It's opposite of what we do. We usually start with the good and then go to the bad. All right. When you study out the genealogies, uh, you'll find the genealogy of Edom first, and the geology, genealogy of Israel second. You'll find the history of Israel first, and the history of Judah second. God always starts with those who are on the wrong side first, and then he ends up with those on the right side. Just You say, why is that? I don't know, but that's the way God did it. Now, um, look back to your notes here. Five had made preparations by bringing oil, and five were foolish because they had not made preparation Now, here's the difference. The foolish assumed that they would have time to make themselves ready or that the groom would come when they were ready. But listen, they did not. They did not get ready. They did not make themselves ready. And they were not ready. And listen, they missed the groom and were barred from the festivities. How many of you think that would be a bad thing? That's a bad thing. That's a very bad thing. How many think that it would be a bad thing that when Jesus comes back, someone's not ready and they miss the rapture? Would you agree with me that's a bad thing? That when Jesus comes and the trumpet sounds, now listen, can I say the Sunday morning, the Sunday morning before Jesus comes back, churches are going to be full all over America. But can I say a sad truth? The Sunday morning after Jesus comes back, there's still going to be a lot of churches full. Listen, in this day, Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven, and we described that. The kingdom of heaven is when that Jesus planted the seeds of the kingdom, and it grew from a little seed of the gospel, one man, Jesus, over in Israel, and then it spread to the 12 disciples, and then it swelled spelled to Israel and uh, Judah and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. And listen, now the gospel is spread all over the world, but listen, there's a great difference. Throughout this study of the perils, we find that Jesus continually reveals to us that there is, listen, on the outside, in Christendom, it's hard to say between, well, we, we go to this church, and they go to that church, and they go to this church, and well, who's right? Well, God's right. But listen, when the trumpet sounds, and Jesus comes back, and the rapture happens, it's going to be very clear who was really ready for the Lord's return, and who was not ready for the Lord's return. So what's the point of this parable? Let's wrap this up here. Jesus himself sums up this powerful and pointed parable 
with one word, watch. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 25 and notice with me in verse 13. If you are in the habit of circling or highlighting or making notation in your Bible, I want to encourage you to circle that one word there, watch. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The whole point is this, Jesus is saying, be ready. Get yourself ready and keep yourself ready for the Lord's return. Now this word, back in your notes here, this word implies more than just to physically look, but to be prepared for His coming. It's more than just looking out the window. Now this is where we encourage people, I, I you know every once in a while it will happen that a certain group of people will be led by a certain crackpot teacher and they will go out and sell their homes and quit their jobs and uh, they'll, they'll go sit up on a grassy hill and they'll get shofar horns and uh, prayer shawls and uh, they'll pick a date uh, usually corresponding to some Jewish festival and I believe the Jewish festival calendar is very significant. I believe it's also prophetic. I believe it has a part in there but I also believe Jesus. And Jesus says in Matthew 25, 13, he says, we don't know the day or the hour. So listen, when somebody says, I know the day and the hour, guess what they are? L-I-A-R. Let's all say it. They're a liar. Amen? And they're a crackpot. All right? They're a nut job. I'll just go on record as saying that. Now listen. Don't listen to them. Don't quit your job. Don't sell your house. Don't pull your kids out of school. Listen. Jesus says, watch, prepare, be ready. But there's another parable that said, occupy till I come. In fact, that's going to be one of the next parables we look at. But <clears throat> go back to our notes here. It means to look to be prepared for his coming. Jesus repeatedly emphasized that the time of his coming will be long and the timing uncertain. We need to get that down. It will surprise many like a thief in the night, but he will come. Now, oil. Prominent in this parable is the the use of oil. Oil in the scriptures is a representation of the Holy Spirit. It is a representation. Oil in the Bible is a representation or a type of the Holy Spirit. Five of these young girls, listen, they had oil in their vessels. You'll notice the pronouns, possessive, singular, individual, their lamps, their vessels, their oil. Uh, the five were wise. They had a lamp. They had oil. Five were foolish. They had no oil. The division between the five wise and five foolish is that they, listen, they both knew the Lord's coming. It is not a religious mystery that Jesus is coming again. The, the entire Christendom knows it, but listen. Both knew of the Lord's coming. Some prepared and some did not. We see in this parable the division of the professing church, the professing church, those who would call themselves a Christian, those active in religion and ritual, as compared or contrasted to the possessing believer, the possessing believer, one sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. What we see here is that, listen, there's a, a group of people all saying they're ready for Jesus to come back. But listen, five of them were saved. Five of them were filled with the oil of the Spirit. And five were just there. They were religious, but they weren't ready. They were going through rituals, but listen, they weren't born again. Now, when the Lord returns, there will not be time to prepare. You will either be ready or you will miss Him. Sad and frightful will be the day when people realize only too late that they miss the Lord's coming to the marriage of the Supper of the Lamb. I, I, you know what, church, you know, one of the reasons that, um, can, can I just say this, ministry is difficult. Ministry is very difficult. It's, it's a never-ending series of battles, burdens, um, and, and, and issues, all right? It's just the way ministry is. You say, Pastor, what, why, why don't you quit, get frustrated, throw your hands up, go retire, you know, put Bermuda shorts on, go play shuffleboard, go do something else, get another job, sell insurance, do, do funerals, whatever. Because listen to me, I want, you, I want you to go down and I want you to look here in verse 11. Afterward, 
came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now, my friend, listen to me. But by the grace of God, that's not you and that's not me. But by the grace of God, some, but listen, you didn't deserve somebody to tell you the gospel. You and I didn't deserve, we, we did nothing to merit somebody loving us and being faithful for us and somebody bringing the gospel and the good news to us. We didn't earn it and we still don't, we don't deserve it. And there's nothing but the grace of God that separates, listen, me and you being inside and enjoying the wedding feast and you and I on the outside desperately knocking at the door saying, but I was in church and I was baptized and I was confirmed, and I was a this, and I was, I was a pastor, or I was a deacon, or I was an altar worker, or I was, a, I was faithful. And listen, my friend, it doesn't matter what church you belong to. It matters who you belong to. It matters not if the oil's on the outside. It matters if the oil's on the inside. Listen, my friend, the thing that keeps me and my wife going, uh, 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 apart from the love of Jesus, Him loving us and us loving Him, He didn't quit on me, I'm not quitting on Him is the fact that there's a world out there, especially in Holland, Michigan, good people, moral people, many of them religious people. And they're looking and they're anticipating, but so many of them are not ready. So many of them have never had a born-again experience through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, my friend, that if that doesn't If that doesn't make you weep, if that doesn't send a shiver up your spine, that there's going to be people that's going to miss it. People that are good people that went to church that are going to miss it. Listen, my friends, somebody has to tell them the truth. Somebody has to keep preaching the gospel. Somebody has to make a difference. And by God's grace, that's going to be us. That's the point of the parable. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening. And Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you so much for the unbelievable, amazing grace that reached us that we didn't deserve. And Father, we thank you for the grace of God, Lord. Lord, that came in the gospel that was given and presented unto us. And Father, I pray, Lord, what a sad day it's going to be on the Sunday after the rapture. And so many are gone, but yet so many are there. So many that thought they were okay because they were in this church or that church but you never knew them. God, I pray and ask you, Lord, first of all, we want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for saving our very undeserving souls. Thank you, Lord, for the invitation and the opportunity to be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thank you, Father, for the grace of God that's reached us. Lord, I pray. God, my heart trembles and, Lord, my heart breaks, Lord, for the millions and billions of religious people around this world, Lord. Lord, have bought into the lie that all religions, Lord, flow from the same stream of truth. That's a lie out of the pit of hell. And God, I pray and I ask, oh God, that you'd help us, Lord, in some small measure to make a difference in our corner of the world. And Father, I pray that through our prayers and through our efforts, dear Lord, people would come to know the life-changing, eternity-changing gospel of Christ. Father, I pray if one has come tonight... And Lord, they found themselves sitting in this auditorium, Lord, or listening by way of a service online. And Lord, they're religious, but Lord, they understand that they're lost. Or God, that they're concerned that, Lord, if you were to come tonight and the trumpet would sound immediately, Lord, they'd be left behind. Father, I pray, Lord, that they'd make preparation to meet you. And God, I pray, oh God, that they would kneel in their pew or kneel in their heart or kneel in their living room or kneel in their car. And God, they'd confess their sins to you and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And and God, that they would receive you as their Savior. And God, they'd believe on you, Lord, to the salvation of their soul. I pray, oh God, that they would become ready for the trumpet to sound. Father, I pray and ask, oh God, for those of us, Lord, who are already saved, Lord, I pray we would watch. I pray, Lord, our life and our living, our conduct, Lord, our character, Lord, would be so, Lord, would be in line with the truth that you're going to come. At any moment, the trumpet's going to sound. And God, I pray and ask, oh God, that we'd be ready. Lord, we thank you for this pointed, powerful parable. Lord, we ask that you'd move in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand this evening with our heads bowed and eyes closed. As the instrumentalists began to play a verse of invitation softly. 
the altar is open, I ask, are you ready? If Jesus came tonight,